We're starting a couple of minutes early because this is, after all, the last session of the day. So um, I am expecting the loudest applause at the end of it, but hopefully you'll be with me on this journey over the next 15 to 20 minutes. So uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, this has been a great Open Telemetry community. This was my first time speaking in Seattle uh, and meeting a lot of the folks that I've seen over LinkedIn or YouTube videos or GitHub issues in person, which is great. Um, so with all that being said, um, I'm here to talk a little bit about what could go wrong with GraphQL queries and can Open Telemetry help us? Um, I assure you it's not going to be a bummer of a topic at all, even though the name might suggest it that way. Um, but um, if Murphy's Law suggests that uh, whatever can go wrong would potentially go wrong or whatever can happen will happen, so let's just be prepared uh, when that happens. I'm not, here gonna, I'm not gonna be evangelizing GraphQL as a technology, so just as a caveat to this, uh, I'm not trying to sell you on using GraphQL, but if you're already sold onto that or considering doing it, then uh, there are a couple of things and challenges that you might encounter, and we'll go through some of those, uh, and hopefully we'll see how open telemetry um, can solve or address some of those things either out of the box or potentially with certain manual instrumentations associated with it. So with that being said, I am Buddha. I am a developer advocate at Tyke. Tyke, for those who do not know, is a cloud native API management platform powered by and, uh, an open source API gateway. We are OTEL native as well as um, we are GraphQL aware as an API gateway, um, and I can tell you all about that later on, but the idea is we kind of know a little bit more about both of these different worlds, some of the challenges, some of the solutions associated with it. Um, I'm originally from India, um, lived most of my life in Singapore, currently living in Durham, North Carolina. Big, big fan of horror movies, but I like my horror on screen and in literature, not so much in software, as you would see with GraphQL today. Um, additionally, I'm the chairperson of uh, the Open API, um, Open API Initiatives Business Governance Board, in case you're working in there as well. So, um, just to set the scene for today, um, I'm looking at two sides of when and how you are sort of promoting or, or, or deploying an application, in this case, a GraphQL application to production. Uh, on one side, obviously, is the development side of things where you're looking at the different capabilities, your business logic of how you're building out your GraphQL application. And the other side is a little bit to do with your operations. How do you make sure that things are stable, they are deployed reliably, and things don't go wrong. And when they do, you at least have a way to actually address those things. So I'm gonna be looking at both of those different sides and hopefully help you get to that next step in that journey. So without, before moving forward, uh, just a quick question. Anyone here who's actually worked with GraphQL before or is working with GraphQL at the moment, considering working with GraphQL at the moment? Okay, -ish. all right. Uh, once again, I'm not gonna be trying to convert the others who did not raise their hands over here, but hopefully address some of the challenges that you might be facing here. Um, so for those who do not know, GraphQL is, uh, it's a query language for uh, APIs and um, a runtime for fulfilling those queries with your existing data. It usually gives you a very, very easy, hopefully straightforward way to describe your data and then let or enables your client side or the developers to actually ask for what they need for their application and then hopefully give those results in a more predictable way. The key difference or the key value of actually having GraphQL as a technology is usually seen uh, in omni-channel applications, especially when you have to cater to different needs of the, of the uh, consuming application. This was kind of the main reason why it was for, created in the first place at Facebook. Um, there are a couple of other things that again, when we talk about GraphQL, we, we have to talk about REST as well. And I think again, REST as an API technology is usually a very, very robust uh, way of dealing with APIs and API styles, but with some of these, uh, with GraphQL, we saw, we noticed that there were a couple of challenges that the rest was kind of unable to solve, um, namely overfetching and underfetching. In this case, overfetching typically refers to um, returning or getting back a lot of information, more than what you might need, and then enabling your, or letting the heavy lifting being done in the front end. Whereas with underfetching, you need to have multiple cycles or multiple queries to be get to get back um, the specific kind of information that you need. In some cases, this might be desirable, but in most cases, that adds to the overall network cost or your payload costs. Moving on, just to give you a little bit of an example of what GraphQL looks like in practice, there is a schema, just kind of like the blueprint of your overall GraphQL API. Um, then the operations usually is, queries are the most typical applications, uh, operations that you do with GraphQL. 
Um, you also have mutations and subscriptions, but you're not going into those. But the key thing to notice over here is that the shape of the response tends to mirror the shape of the request, which makes things a lot more predictable in the way you uh, receive or get information. And again, you can request specific pieces of information out of the schema as opposed to getting back every single thing that has been enabled by the API producers in this case. So with that being said, uh, I'm going to set the scene again today for uh, the application that we're going to be using as a sample. In this case, this is a travel application. The server side includes a couple of different components. There are a few different services that you see. There are a couple of REST APIs that are being called as part of the GraphQL application. In some cases, you can go directly building out your own schema. In some cases, you actually connect with existing data points as well, both of these completely valid. Uh, the application itself is a Node.js application, even though some might say JavaScript is not a language. But sure, we'll, 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 we'll talk about that later on. Um, <laughs> in the simplest use case of a GraphQL application, you would, you would have a React app or a front end, a single front end that is making this call, uh, in which case GraphQL may not be the right way because it might be a little bit going overboard. Whereas a more typical applications would be that you have multiple applications or multiple clients making these requests. You might have different apps that could be internal facing, could be partner facing, could be an API marketplace of its own that, would, that you would need to consider. So with that, again, definitely uh, one of the components that you do need to consider is an API gateway typically. Um, and again, I'm not just saying it because I work in this space, but a GraphQL aware, mature GraphQL aware API gateway adds a whole range of benefits, again, when you're working with observability specifically, because it acts, as the name suggests, as a gateway into your application, but also as a mediator between the different uh, security protocols and measures that you might be integrating with, as well as different governance practices out there. And when you're thinking about end-to-end -end tracing or end-to-end -end observability, ideally, you need to consider every single component of your stack. Now, how do you monitor GraphQL in production? And one of the ways of doing that is to apply the RED method. For those who are not familiar with the RED method, the RED, it is a monitoring strategy that, um, that is used to gain insight into the health and performance of distributed systems. Um, typically, the RED stands for the rate, errors, and duration. And again, if you're familiar with it, that's great. Based on these metrics, you can understand how good your service is doing and uh, set up your SLOs accordingly. Now, to think about how we can start adding open telemetry to the travel app that we just saw, the first step is to instrument your GraphQL service with open telemetry to get distributed traces. Um, and again, now there are, there are different implementations of GraphQL available in the market. In this case, we've gone specific to the Node.js instrumentation. In case you're looking for one that is specific to your application, uh, you can always, always go to the OpenTelemetry website and under ecosystems, just search for um, the instrumentation requirements there. And I think we found one for Node.js, at least in this case. Uh, moving right along, so we use the trace.js file uh, to instrument our service with OpenTelemetry. And uh, this is how we add the GraphQL instrumentation here. You will also notice that we are exporting the spans to the OpenTelemetry collector. Uh, and we see the result uh, that we have. We have got end-to-end -end distributed traces in Jaeger. Um, and we can see Tyke API Gateway starting off the trace as an entry point um, for the transaction and then reporting some spans. Then the GraphQL services take over afterwards, and then it goes into sort of the underlying REST APIs, the upstream APIs to go with it. So now that we've got all the setup done, let's move forward into how you're going to be getting the red metrics integrated. Jaeger already has some of these out-of-the-box integrations available. Uh, it uses a component in the hotel collector called the span metrics connector to generate these metrics based on the spans. Um, and the span metrics collector creates two metrics based on uh, the span itself, the calls total and um, the latency, I believe, a latency count. So those metrics are stored in Prometheus and Jaeger and will connect to Prometheus to display these uh, metrics. Uh, finally, this is kind of the dashboard. You finally have a look at this uh, in the monitor tab. You can now see the request rate. You can see the error rate um, and the duration for uh, your GraphQL service. So we're all, all good to go now. Let's look at some of the possible errors that might happen. We'll be looking at two of them. One of them is the upstream errors, and the other one is a resolver error. Um, so the first one, as you can see here, I'm trying to uh, send a request to, to get information about um, the country Italy, in this case, um, along with its weather data. But uh, 
there seems to be something that's gone wrong, as we can see from the message over there. We're not getting the right response, so now let's look at how we can start troubleshooting this. So if you look, go straight into the dashboard, uh, the Jaeger dashboard, you will already see that there is an increase in the error rate. Um, and I can, then we can, as a next step of this, we can start looking at the traces. And I can find within the traces by filtering them in Jaeger using the error tag, uh, you'll be able to see that A, the, 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 you can actually see that you can, um, the GraphQL service itself is giving a 500 HTTP status code. And uh, that is because it's a consequence of uh, the weather service itself uh, returning a 400 error, the external upstream weather service that we are connected to. So in this example, I can get all the information I need from OpenTelemetry, and I can check out uh, which query is having this issue as well if you wanted to go a little bit deeper, a little bit more specific. So done, resolved, fixed that issue, and now we're all back and, back and happy. The final one, we go into the, uh, the resolver issue here. Um, this seems to be a little bit more unique, so we'll, we'll go into that a little bit right now, where, again, we, we see an error that is, that is being um, shown here. Um, but in this case, when we look at the dashboard, we're not really getting a hint as to what's really going on in this case. Um, neither can we find something over here. It looks like everything is fine, so we're not really able to reproduce this at this stage. Now, there is a reason for this, because for those who are, again, familiar with GraphQL, a big challenge with GraphQL is that at the status code level, the HTTP status code, typically, even when things are going wrong, tends to give back a 200 um, response, and that has its own challenges. So even if things are not going well, GraphQL can be the perfect optimist, pretty much turning a blind eye to what's going on underneath. So you don't want that. You obviously want to get to the uh, heart of the issue in this case. Um, and as you can see, the, the object body or the, the response body is where you can actually see the errors coming up, and it has its own object where you can see some of the different details around it. It has message and it has location, but how do we catch this as an error? Um, so let's, let's go diving a little bit into the semantic convention that's associated with GraphQL at this point of time. And it looks like it's a little bit limited. There are a couple of different options available here, but it doesn't go into, say, a GraphQL error. So it's not giving me the specific, um, ish, specific conventions that I would need to actually get to the heart of this issue in this case. So let's just add our own attribute, and we're going to be calling it a GraphQL error dot message and uh, with, with some manual instrumentation. I've added that now into my code. And now I can start seeing um, the errors being recorded on my spans. One thing you will still notice is that the entry point is still giving me a 200 because that doesn't change here. But we are getting a bit more information here. And especially if you go into Prometheus in this case, we can find out that the error rates are being reported based on the manual instrumentation that has happened. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're working with GraphQL. The HTTP status 200 is not always uh, an indicator that everything is fine. And then finally, we talk about a little bit about performance here. Um, one of uh, the other challenge of GraphQL is that um, the endpoint of a GraphQL API is typically, again, a slash GraphQL or something to that effect. So the main changes or updates, the requests that are going through are, again, at a layer below, which is in the form of queries. So you can still be calling that same endpoint, but requesting different forms of data. Um, and that could be very, very flexible in the way, in whichever way the, the requester wants it to be. So it, they can essentially call it in any particular order that they want to, or that shape could be completely different for every single one of the requests that they might make. So this obviously poses a little bit of a challenge um, where there could be, you know, we could have multiple clients consuming this API, each in their own, own way, um, but it also poses that challenge of, um, how do you then profile that performance? Because uh, what could be right for a specific query for a specific client uh, may not be right for the others. So how do you actually start looking or thinking about that a little bit more? So what you need in this case is while that P95 value over there um, is an indicator of some things, it, it's really not enough because it's just giving you an average um, overall error rate or latency rate in this case. Uh, which again doesn't give you the full picture. So we need to go a little bit more granular in this case. And there are some typical performance issues that can be seen with GraphQL. Um, we are not gonna go into each one of them given a, a few minutes left for us. Um, so 
I'm going to just talk about the first one, but we, I'm happy to discuss the remaining ones um, directly with you if you wanted to have a chat. But the most typical performance issue that you see here is the N plus 1 issue. Again, if you're not familiar with it, um, it basically means that when you're making a request or, or querying some data, it, the first response is to get back a set of, um, set, of, set of information or resources. And then as a subsequent call, you're essentially going into each one of those resources and making a query for each one of them, hence the N plus one problem. It is fixable by using things like data loaders, but it can also be quite easily overlooked. And you don't want that because it has a lot of huge performance implications for your GraphQL APIs. Um, so how do you solve that? There's actually a fairly straightforward way to doing to to, to actually solving this. Um, in this example, again, you can see that you know a very simple query has actually gone into a pretty much of a cycle where you've got multiple uh, continents and countries coming up as the response. With open telemetry, uh, you can nicely detect this n, n plus one query problem. Uh, in this particular example, if you look at this dashboard with Jaeger, you'll see that within the trace diagram that one query has led to 27 HTTP GET calls, uh, and that's a typical indicator that something is going wrong, in, which case, in this case, specifically, N plus um, one is, is likely the cause here. So you can even get that number in Prometheus if you wanted to look at it. Um, so getting an average number of outgoing requests for GraphQL query, if it's that high, typically means that something is wrong, and in this case, that is probably an N plus one problem. You can set alerts in test or in your production environment to actually um, get to know when this is happening. Then finally, the final steps here. Um, so we've kind of understood a little bit more about what's going on. Um, we spoke about um, the open telemetry is still useful as a way to troubleshoot your GraphQL APIs, uh, but there are still certain things that you need to consider, including you know, the semantic inventions are still a little bit limited. Uh, it needs to be a little bit more specific in terms of GraphQL. Um, and then the instrumentation providers or uh, the instrumentation vendors may not always respect the common semantic convention and may have their own implementations, and that could pose its own challenge. Um, but uh, it's a work in progress where I think we've started contributing a little bit more in this area. Uh, we opened up an issue here, so feel free to comment and uh, add your uh, considerations, your um, you know, contributions to this. Um, hopefully this takes the shape of something a little bit more formal over the next um, few months and years. And with that, um, it looks like everyone's happy at this point. Hopefully we managed to address some of the key challenges around GraphQL with open telemetry in production. Uh, both sides of the party, the developers as well as the operation side is, is a bit more happy having a little bit more reliability baked into their system. So that's it, uh, the final talk, hopefully with five minutes left for today. Um, that's, that's me. Um, on the right hand side, there, is, there are a couple of resources um, I've created a couple of courses around open telemetry, API observability, and API platforms. Feel free to check those out or connect with me on LinkedIn if you so desire. So with that, um, I come to the end of the presentation and hopefully all presentations for the day. So thank you so much. Appreciate it.